Hello, I'm Professor Sylviana Amethyst, and I would like to sketch a function with you without using a graphing calculator. I'm going to do this using a six-step process. I have a function written on the board right now, and we're going to analyze the domain of the function, its roots and y-intercept, the limits and infinity, asymptotes, looking specifically for vertical asymptotes, the critical points, and the concavity. So we're going to construct all of those using calculus, and then we're going to construct a graph. So I'd like to talk with you about the six things that we're going to analyze about this function in order to construct a graph. The first thing is going to be the domain. Where's the function defined? Um, is it like a square root function in that we're missing like half of the real numbers? Is it like the function um, absolute value of x over x? So it's defined everywhere except for one point. So this is the first thing that we need to know about a function in order to sketch it. Second thing we need to know are the intercepts. Where does the function intersect the axes? The third thing that we want to know are the limits at positive and negative infinity. That's the leading behavior. The fourth thing I want to know is about any vertical asymptotes the function has. The fifth thing I want to know is about the critical points, the function's optima. The sixth thing I want to know is about the function's concavity. These six things describe the shape of a graph pretty fully. And if we know these six things, then I know this, I know what the graph looks like. So um, as far as this function, I'll quickly describe the six pieces for it. Then I'll construct a graph, and then I'd like to talk through how I know each of those six things about this function. So the first thing, the domain. The domain is the set of points for which a function can return an output value, the set of points um, that are valid inputs. Looking at this function, we've got um, rational power and polynomial. The polynomial part, x to the fourth over four, that's defined everywhere. And the x to the sixth over seven, that's also defined everywhere. So the domain is all real points. I'm going to write that with a, with a fancy r. Isn't that such a fun character? I love the fancy r. The second thing we need to know are the intercepts. Um, and those are going to come in the flavor of the x-intercepts. Um, those are the roots, and those are going to be the points positive and negative 14 to the 7 over 22. Like I said, I'll talk about how I got those later. The y-intercept um, I, I get by plugging when x is 0, um, and so that is 0, comma, 0. The limits at infinity and at positive infinity, both of those limits are infinity. Asymptotes, this function has none. Critical points, this function has um, three critical points, and they occur for x equals 0 and x equals positive and negative 3 to the 7 over 22. What an odd number. <laughs> actually, it's irrational. It's not odd. Um, as far as concavity goes, actually, we have no inflection points. We have one possible inflection point. And that is at x equals 0. Um, and the function is concave up everywhere. So those six pieces, let me put together a sketch. Let's draw some axes and then use these six pieces to do the sketch. First, the domain. This function is defined everywhere. I'm not going to have any holes in it. Um, I don't know how to express that except by, like, not crossing things out. So... I guess we should label our axes. <laughs> Good scientist labels their axes. For the intercepts, let's label those. Um, I've got uh, 14 to the 7 over 22. And I have minus 14 to the 7 over 22. And 0, 0. So I know that my function passes through those three points. The limits at infinity, the function is going off to infinity in both directions. So I know it's going to do something like that. 
As far as asymptotes, none. So nothing to sketch there. There's no like hard wall that it can't pass. Um, as far as the critical points go, I've got three critical points. Um, we've got one at zero and one at positive and negative three to the 722. And I might just put like a horizontal line somewhere in those. Those last two ticks that I drew there, um, I shouldn't have done those because the function we know passes through zero, zero. I just don't know what the height of my function is at, um, at minus three to the seven twenty second or three to the seven twenty second. So, so um, I do know that the function is concave up everywhere. So I have up concave arrows. I really like concavity arrows. So I have up concave arrows everywhere. Now I have a function that's concave up. Um, and so I know that my function has to pass kind of like this, right? And I can't like, there's no way for me to connect them between there like that because that's concave down. So the concave up thing forces me to be able to connect like that. Now we also will happen to know, and we'll cover this when we start talking about um, the critical points, that this function actually has a cusp. And I know it has a cusp because the slope at, um, at the origin, the slope of the function around the origin goes to infinity and negative infinity. So I actually can do a little bit better. I know that my function goes vertical right there, but just for a moment, I think I can start getting a little bit more concrete in this one. There we go. I think that's our function. Um, observe, this function is defined everywhere. Look, domain, all real numbers. I don't have any holes or anything like that. It's just everywhere. There's no hole there. It is defined there. Um, I've got my intercepts. Great. Checking that off. Limits at infinity, positive infinity. Asymptotes, none. Critical points, boop, boop, boop and concavity, concave up everywhere. Um, there's some additional analysis that I'll talk through when I go and compute these six things with you. Let's talk through the six different properties of this function as related to sketching the graph. First, the domain. Well, we've got two pieces. We've got two summands, right? I've got this um, x to the six over seven, and I've got x to the fourth. And I'm going to omit the coefficients because the coefficients don't influence whether the term is defined there or not. Um, the x to the fourth, that's polynomial. And that's defined everywhere. And that one right there, that's got rational power. And it has um, an odd number in the denominator. And so it's defined everywhere. Since both of those are defined everywhere, then f is defined everywhere. Note that if our function had had um, an even number in the denominator, then we'd be trying to take an even root and then it wouldn't be defined for negative numbers. So we'd have to check the thing underneath and make sure that um, we know where that thing is negative because the function won't be defined there. The second thing we'll study about the function are its intercepts. The y-intercept is where x equals zero. And that one's pretty easy. We'll just plug it in. And we get um, y equals f at 0 equals uh, 0. I'm going to trust that you know how to do the plugging in and evaluation for these things. So, um, so the y-intercept is 0. As far as the x-intercept, those are the roots of the function. Um, and that's where 0 equals f of x equals minus 7 halves x to the 6 over 7 plus x to the fourth over four. Now, um, we should note that we also have the value zero here. And then I'm gonna play an algebraic trick, supposing that x is not equal to zero. And it's important that I make the note that x is not equal to zero for this next step, because if you multiply two sides of something by zero, of an equation by zero, 
you get zero equals zero, which is a useless statement. So we should always guard against multiplying by zero on both sides of an equation so that we don't just get useless, just a useless pointless statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my zero equals minus seven halves x to the six sevens plus x to the fourth over four. I'm going to multiply both sides by x to the minus six sevens. So observe that as I distribute across that quantity right there, um, the, the, the powers, that six sevens and that minus six sevens, those are going to cancel. Those powers are going to cancel. And so I'm going to put this minus seven halves by itself. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm multiplying by something that isn't zero. Um, it's also, in this case, not, um, a, not a number like negative infinity or something like that. And so this next step is out. So then I get zero equals minus seven halves plus um, a quarter of x to the fourth plus minus six sevenths. And I think we should rewrite that four as 28 sevenths. So let's make that change. And that says that 7 halves is equal to, um, uh, I'm going to multiply by 4 at the same time also, boop, to clear that. So then I'll have x to the 22 sevenths, because 28 minus 6 is 22. So on the left, I have 14. And then I take the 22nd root of both sides, and this is where I get the positive and negative from. So positive and negative. Um, 14 to the 1 over 22 equals x to the 1 over 7. And then I take the 7th power of both sides of that. Um, and that eliminates the 1 7th on the right-hand side. And then I have 7 over 22. So that's how I get my um, intercepts, both the y-intercept and the x-intercept or the roots. The third thing that we should investigate are the limits at positive and negative infinity. So let's take the limit as x approaches minus infinity of f of x. Let's not needlessly write f of x, so let's go minus 7 over 2 x to the 6 over 7 plus x to the 4th over 4. A couple of parens to make sure the limit is applied to the whole thing. And um, I like just plugging in negative infinity in places. If you've seen my earlier videos, I am I'm quite content to, to work with infinity and negative infinity as if they were numbers, even though they aren't. And I get minus 7 halves um, of minus infinity to the 6 sevenths plus infinity to the 4th over 4. And even though that term is negative and this term is positive, um, the term infinity to the 4th over 4 dominates. And this limit is equal to positive infinity. Similarly, if I put positive signs on my infinity, I get the exact same argument, um, and I get infinity. So both limits of positive and negative infinity for f are positive infinity. The fourth thing we should talk about are asymptotes. f has no asymptotes. Um, I can see that because the function is defined everywhere. And really what I'm talking about as far as this argument is um, the vertical asymptotes, we could also consider like linear slanted asymptotes um, or horizontal asymptotes, um, but I'm going to be content with vertical asymptotes. F is defined everywhere. A function which is defined everywhere cannot possibly have a vertical asymptote. It can have horizontal um, or slanted asymptotes, but it cannot have a vertical asymptote. The fifth thing that we should look at are the critical points and local optima of the function. For this, we're going to need to compute the derivative um, and figure out where it's not defined and where it's zero. So our first step is going to take f prime. Um, so that's going to be uh, minus 7 halves 6 over 7, x to the minus 1 over 7. And you know that because you've been working on the power rule and really internalized that one. Plus, we'll do the power rule again, x cubed. Let's do some simplification. My 7s cancel, my 6 and 2 cancel, and I get a 3. And so um, f prime 
then is equal to three with a minus sign, um, x to the minus one over seven plus x cubed. And I'm gonna take a note of that here because I'm gonna need it again when I compute the concavity of the function via the second derivative. So I'm gonna write down the f prime is equal to minus three x to the minus one seventh plus x cubed. So let's look at this function critically, this derivative. It's got two terms. The first term right here, that's not defined at zero. And that means that um, f has a critical point at zero. So since I know I'm, that the work I'm about to do is um, some number of steps, I'm gonna erase some stuff. Um, in principle, I would like to have a much longer piece of paper to work on. But. So now we need to find the places where the derivative is zero. So we'll just set the derivative equal to zero. That's where zero equals minus three x to the minus one seventh plus x cubed. Um, I know that x is not equal to zero for this step here because then the, the derivative is undefined there and that's not allowed. And that means that I get a multiply by x to the one seventh on both sides. On the left hand side, I'll still have zero because zero times anything is zero as long as it's a number. On the right hand side, I'll have minus three. And now note when I distribute that across that minus one seven and positive one seven powered, those add and uh, cancel to be zero, which is great. There's, that's gonna happen a lot. Um, so I'll have minus three plus x to the three plus one seventh. Let's raise that three and draw that as 21 sevenths so that I'm gonna have three equals x to the 22 sevenths. All I did was move that three to the other side, combine the 21 over seventh and the one seventh. Then I will take the um, 22nd root and the seventh power of both sides, and then I'm gonna get positive and negative three to the 722. And so I have two more critical points to list in my list, three, seven over 22. So I have three critical points to this function. Um, we can classify these if these want, if we want. I really like using number lines to do this. So that's gonna be my real number line. I'm gonna put zero there. I'm gonna put minus three to the seven twenty second and three to the seven twenty second on that number line. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to evaluate um, F prime at test point. Um, and so all we need to do is know the, the, the sign of the derivative at a single point in each of these one, two, three, four intervals in order to know um, the sign everywhere in those intervals. And that's because the critical points are the only places where the sign of the derivative can change. That's what makes it be a critical point. So um, I'm gonna choose some test points. I happen to know that um, three to the seven twenty second is about 1.4, which means I'm gonna choose a test point out here as negative two, negative one, one, and two. So those are my test points. Those are my test points. And then I'm going to evaluate my function at that, f prime at minus two. And I only care about the SIGN sign. I don't care about the actual value. I happen to know that that's less than zero. And I just plug in my test point to f prime. So I just plug in minus two to the derivative and I get a negative number. Similarly, if I plug in negative one, I get that f prime is bigger than zero. On the next interval, f prime is less than zero. And then finally, f prime is bigger than zero. By using the first derivative test, I can classify um, zero as, let's see here, the function is um, increasing and then decreasing. I see a sign change in the derivative. So zero is a local max, minus three to the 722nd. That is because the function's derivative is negative and then positive. The derivative crosses like that. That means we have a local min. And that's also gonna be true at three to the 722nd because my derivative is negative 
then my derivative is positive. The derivative crosses like that, not the function. The derivative crosses like that. And when I see the derivative cross the x-axis like that, then I have a local min. We're almost there. We have one, one, we have one property left to compute. The last property that we need to compute about our function is its concavity. That's given by the sine of the second derivative. The first thing we need to do when we're doing this is to find the possible inflection points. It's a pretty straightforward process. Take the derivative and set it equal to zero. What are we taking the derivative of? The derivative. So I need to know f double prime. Well, that's f prime prime. So I'm just going to take that. That's why I kept this around. I'm just going to take the derivative of that, um, and I'll have minus 3 times minus 1 seventh x to the minus 8 sevenths plus 3x squared. Inflection points can occur when the second derivative is undefined or 0. I always like to do the undefined ones first um, because I often forget them. Like, I'm just so excited about taking derivatives and setting them equal to zero that I forget to do the other part. So I need to ask the question, where is f double prime undefined? The 3x squared term is always defined. It's this other term here, and that's undefined at x equals zero. There's a lot of that going on in this problem. The second place I need to find are those possible inflection points where the second derivative could be zero. So I'm just going to set 0 equals, um, I'm going to start doing some algebra, 3 sevenths x to the minus 8 sevenths um, plus 3x squared. Let's eliminate some 3s, shall we? Cool, I like that. Now, can you guess the algebraic step that I'm going to do to get rid of that pesky x to the minus 8 sevenths? If you guessed multiply by x to the 8 sevenths on both sides, you win a gold star. On the left-hand side, I'll still have a 0. On the right-hand side, I'll have a 7th plus x to the 14 sevenths plus 8 sevenths. What do you know? That's going to be 22 sevenths on that right-hand side there again. That says that minus a 7th is equal to x to the 22 over 7. At this point, I want to take the 22nd root of both sides, but I have a negative number inside of there. Um, and this thing right here, that's not real. It's not that it's undefined. It's that it's not real, right? That's a member of the complex numbers, which we write as a fancy C. We're only working over real numbers in this class. Um, and so um, I'm just going to stop here. Okay. So, what we found is that we have a number line of the real numbers. That's the domain of the function. There's a possible inflection point at 0. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose a test point on either side. I love using 1s and zeros when I possibly can, the simplest possible numbers. Um, and then I'm going to evaluate um, f double prime at my test points. So f double prime at negative 1. And again, I only care about the sign, just like with um, doing the first derivative test. Um, and I get a positive number. f double prime of 1 is a positive number. That gives me the additional information that I have a critical point out here, minus 3 to the um, 7 over 22, and over here, 3 to the 7 over 22. So then by the second derivative test, I have that um, positive and negative 3 to the 7 over 22 are both um, local minima. Bringing this full circle, we've now worked through computing using algebra. The six properties of a function that we're really interested in when making a graph. Let me sum them up. I have the domain, the intercepts, the limits, the asymptotes, the critical points, and the concavity, all of which I computed without using a graphing calculator. I can use those properties to construct a graph. The domain of the function is all real numbers. I have no holes. I have the intercepts, both the roots and the y-intercept. I have the limits at infinity. 
My asymptotes, there were none. My critical points, we found that there was a local min at positive and negative 7 to the 20 sec uh, 7 over 20 second. Um, and I have that the function is concave up everywhere. So putting all of those things together, I've got a pretty decent sketch of this function. Of course, it could also look something like that, right? That is the same properties, um, but it kind of doesn't matter. Like I have the general idea, and if you just change the scale of the y-axis, you get my green graph instead of my red graph. So I hope that I've convinced you that studying these six properties of a function is incredibly useful and that for functions with a cusp, um, this can really help. I hope that you have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for watching.